And being humble and being grateful, these are certain things that will give you the endurance to last and maintain your reputation. What is up, our fellow Legacy Ninja? It's a beautiful thing when you tap into your gift and understand the power of what you possess. If you haven't done that yet, take the time, do a deep dive, and find out what you possess that you're able to provide others as a tool, as a gift that can impact their lives and help them make that next step, help them see a different perspective because you showed up, played big, and you shared your gift. Within this episode, Patrick and I had the pleasure of having a phenomenal conversation with Richard Blank and just discussing his perspective on how to really impact the lives of others. What you have in your possession growing up and what you can turn around and utilize that gift that you had growing up to go and make a true impact in the lives of others. Within this episode, we discuss the idea of the inside out approach, showing up differently, and the power of connection and plugging in. After this episode, take the time and really do that deep dive. Find out if you're tapping into your true gift to show up differently, to impact the lives of others that you're supposed to impact because you're tapping into your gift, because you're tapping into what that is for you. That's your special sauce that's going to impact other people's lives. Other than that, enjoy the episode and we'll catch you later. What is up everyone, our fellow Legacy Ninjas here with another episode, Scott Brantz, Patrick Murakami. And uh, today, the guest that we have, uh, for the episode, Richard Blank, such a phenomenal journey and just his perspective as somebody as a CEO. And it's one of those things that when you have somebody that's in a position like this and you get feedback and you just never know, uh, like we tell people until you get the feedback, you just never know. So it's a phenomenal thing to be able to connect with phenomenal individuals, uh, individuals that are doing big things, really has a bigger drive and a bigger vision for what they want to do within society, the changes that they want to bring forward, the impact that when they really sit down and look at it, they're like, I haven't really truly thought about that bigger impact until now. And so Richard, when you think about the idea of legacy and the journey that you've been on coming from growing up in Philadelphia, the moves through the world that you've been on now being down in Costa Rica and the people that you're working with, the legacy, the business that you're building, what does that legacy look like for you? Or what does that pertain to you on what you're wanting to leave behind? Well, first, Patrick and Scott, thank you so much for having me on your show today. I really love your work and it inspired me enough to reach out and, and here we are. And so to share my story, I guess my legacy is a that I've been feeding families for the past 14 years, owning my own company, and also the fact that I can increase self-reliance and self-confidence so these agents working with me receive their dignity, and hopefully I could be the last boss that they ever have, and so they can continue this sort of tradition of synergy and, and treating people well and following certain labor laws and doing all the correct things so they can have their own legacies and a stable business for a very long time. Man, I love that. You know, it's so weird right now with everything. People are trying to find good quality work. People are ghosting even on their job interviews. People are coming in and doing a one day training and coming in two days later asking for their paychecks. You know, it's such a weird time that we live in, but we're also I mean, for how long has it been the opposite way where, you know, people are saying, you have to come work for me, you know, you have to sign this contract that you're going to be here for this amount of time, you know, if I'm providing this, this, and this. So it's so refreshing to hear somebody that says, you know what, I want these people so that way I can be their last boss. That's such an incredible statement, Richard, and I, 
have always kind of had that same philosophy, even within my business. You know, I tell people all the time, I don't know how long I have you, but my goal is for the time that I do is to set you up. So that way you have skills to help you move forward with whatever comes next. And so I really love that philosophy that you have. And I learned this business from the inside out. When I came to Costa Rica at 27, I was only supposed to be here for two months uh, working at my friend's call center teaching English. And I took that one in a million opportunity to stay. And so in those four years, instead of being C-level executive and with contracts and finances, I pretty much learned the business from the inside and out with the proletariat. I was a guest in this country, but my major in college was Spanish and communication. So I was, you know, I mastered their language prior to moving here at 27. So it really gave me a chance to give an amazing first impression to be embraced, but also to acclimate myself much easier in regards to this new industry that I was seeing where I was fascinated. Anybody that's recuperating their educational financial investment by earning this money, speaking a second language, I thought that was incredible. And these were amazing skilled agents all with phone. And today it's really non-voice omni-channel support where people are just filling out forms or doing texting. And so they're almost losing the art of speech. Mm. And so by teaching these sort of advanced soft skills, especially since English is their second language, Scott, I pretty much invested in their future by talking about the thesaurus so they can learn similes and expand their vocabulary to be more clear when they speak. But how about this? When they come into the company, and yes, I have people that jump and come in for training and don't come back. It's not like I need to earn their business every day. I have to separate myself from all the other bosses that didn't know their name, hmm. that didn't give them all the resources and onboarded them correctly. And, and prior to make a single phone call for me, gentlemen, I, I have a gamification culture here. So I've collected pinball machines and retro arcade machines. And so I have this very safe, neutral environment where people can meet each other from other departments. They can let off steam or recharge batteries or even hang out with their boss in there. But let's say it's their first day. Why don't they spend the first half an hour of their day at my center playing games with the other 15 people they'll be working with, knowing the supervisors in May. So when they come into class, instead of just absorbing, they're comfortable enough to start contributing. And so if they make some friends, if they're treated a certain way on the first day, I don't know, Scott and, and, and Patrick, maybe they will come back tomorrow. I like that. And, and so that's the sort of empathetic approach that I take that has given me very good returns. Yeah. And what I'm hearing essentially is that just you're changing the culture and you're creating that safe space in that environment. So people can immediately connect and, and plug in and also understand from the very beginning that this is a very different space to be in. Um, you know, a lot of times with the call centers, and again, I spent 17 years in the call centers. So oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and for me, like on one hand, being in the finance industry, they just continued to tack on more skills. But for me, there was no pay to go with it. So for me, it was kind of like, on one hand, very soul sucking, right? But on the other hand, man, to be able to learn a skill where you can sell on the phone, right? When you can service on the phone, you can read emotional intelligence and you can match tone and pace. And I wouldn't have learned all those things, which would not allow me to be as effective as I am in today's world when it comes to sales, when it comes to you know, winning over and inspiring my team, things like that. So, um, you know, for as much bad as I've maybe talked about in the last few years as becoming an entrepreneur, I do credit very much all those skill sets and the things that I learned to be able to set me up for the next level. No, oh, absolutely. And I'm sure since you worked in a call center, you're very familiar with quality control and quality assurance. Yes. The rating Scott on his KPIs. But yes, yeah, Scott, I'm sure you get very good grades asking qualifying questions. But you and I are, are talking about the soft skills. We're also you're very familiar with a positive escalation where if I'm making a prospecting outbound phone call prior to speaking to you know, Patrick, I'm going to let him know how great Scott was before transferring me the call. And so these are excellent ways for you to show good faith and give a gift. So 
And, and Scott, you mentioned about selling over the phone, and I understand the movies and and, and their sort of uh, imagery that we have being a telemarketer and a call center owner. But I see it more as from an educated point of view, make a decision. I can't force a hand. And also, you're mentioning attrition and people not coming back. Maybe it's the campaigns they were offering them. Yeah. I'm very selective of what comes in here. And Costa Rica is a very strict Catholic country. And so it's not about fulfilling the needs of the client. I have to fulfill the need of the agent. Mm. They have to go home and tell their mother what they do for a living. Mm. So I'm not going to compromise any sort of labor laws or ethic codes in order to earn a dollar. But you also brought something else. Uh, Scott, you're bringing up all this cool stuff about matching people's tones on the phone. And there's something that I do here. I think I've mastered phonetic micro expression reading. So I've seen certain tell signs that people do on the phone, non-visual, that will then give you a sort of trigger to be able to ask a tie down or a pin down question mm. in order to move a conversation forward. And I also back that up by studying the answering speed because they can't do this subconsciously and manipulate it as they can their tone, rate, or pitch. Your mirror imaging, Scott, should be done in regards to their rate and their speaking level. Because if you're matching their speed, there shouldn't be any sort of uh, interruptions or crosstalk. You're matching their style. Why am I doing this? It's to see if in that 30 seconds to two minutes on a first time phone call in that sort of attention span to see if there's a change. And I also believe as well, since people are working from home, gentlemen, that there's noise in the background. And so if you hear a dog that could be killing the call. What you should do is inadvertently and passive aggressively use the me too technique. Let them know how much I love dogs, but Patrick, you know, this, you got to ask the follow-up question. What's the dog's name? <laughs> right. say Aspen, right? Colorado. Yeah. And say, so, yeah, okay, great. Aspen sounds wonderful. Put him outside. He's too loud. Right. And then when you come back to the call, that's usually when I can anchor you. You're going to say, once again, we're talking about Aspen, but you can say, excuse me, what is your name again? That's an excellent question, Scott. My name is Richard. And, okay, Richard, now your name dropping me for the rest of the call. We, we call that the buffer boomerang technique. When someone asks you a question with a negative tone, what you do is you buffer the negative tone. I name drop you, let you know it's a great question. And then I repeat the question to show active listening and then boomerang it back with a plus two. And this can be done a half a dozen to a dozen times on the call. Absolutely. I think what you learn from people in sales, uh, what makes them so successful is the ability to build trust and rapport. And where oftentimes, a lot of times where I'm coaching my team is it's not, if you're waiting, so we're in, in an insurance world, we're in an uphill battle because insurance companies that are self-insured, billion dollar companies advertising on price, yes. right? And the premise of insurance going back to like 200 BC is just to restore you back to whole. So Oftentimes, what I tell my team is if you're waiting to just talk numbers, you're not going to sell that policy where it's a 50-50 chance. But if you build trust, you build rapport, they they know that you're actually looking out for their best interests. Now, there's there's leeway. Price can be the same. Price could be a little bit more. But they trust you. They know that you have their attention, and they know that you're going to take care of them, and it makes a big difference. Now, all of a sudden price is a secondary factor. And so um, I love hearing all this stuff because this is the type of stuff that I study, right? Learning interactions, dialogue, you know, how to create rapport with others. So man, I'm, I'm impressed with the training and the things that you guys are teaching, you know, in these skill sets. So tell us a little bit about what that expansion looks like when somebody's maybe gone through you know, and kind of learned everything and, and has gone to the next level, you know, what does that look like? Do you guys still stay involved? Are you guys investors into some of these things with people maybe going on the next level? What does that look like? Oh, you're always investing in their momentum. I just want to take one step back for a second in regards to these quality insurance calls that you're talking about. Yes. I think individuals should take another 30 seconds to a minute to do some due diligence, maybe look up a website, maybe look up a LinkedIn profile. So instead of just calling you, sir, we can talk about the 17 years you had in the, in the center or where you are. We live in the United States and have those things in common. And so today, since a lot of people are not answering the phones or people are downsizing or working from home, 
a lot of the strategies we use in some of the verticals that we have is by sending emails and leaving voicemails because mm-hmm. a lot of the calls you're just catching people the contact ratio is a lot lower mm-hmm. so my suggestion is instead of blasting out 150 emails a day why don't you do 120 and take a little bit of extra time to congratulate somebody on a promotion or do something in regards to the company culture mm-hmm. and so i have seen an increased ratio of responses in regards to these custom-made voicemails and emails and if you're even talking insurance why don't you google map where they live and talk about the beautiful white porch and how they spent the last 50 years in that house and so those are the sort of things and, and i couldn't agree with you more i almost tell them to put the checkbook away and I just want to talk to you yeah. at the end of the call, you know, after I've lasted 15 rounds and you've given me some country time lemonade, <laughs> then we can talk about um, the other steps. But I love asking follow-up questions and looking at photographs and finding out people's histories because those are excellent ways to find tons of things in common. Absolutely. But it's, it's a beautiful thing, especially coming from somebody in a position like you are, Richard, that CEO position, actually taking the humanistic approach when you're working with individuals, when you're working with your workforce, your agents that are there to help with the business, to grow the business. But your approach and your view is really getting to that human level and taking an interest in who they are as an individual. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people have lost in today's society is taking the time to get to know somebody at a human level. Mm -hmm. And so I think like with our initial call, that vulnerability piece, that transparency piece for somebody in your position, what you're doing really does set the standards for somebody that is, if you're trying to grow, build, take the time and look at where you're at and say, is there something else that I need to do? Do I need to adjust do I need to get at a different level that maybe I'm overlooking because we've got so quick in society where it's the microwave, the instant gratification, Amazon, two day prime, you get it right away. And we miss out on that humanistic aspect, which is the sad part because we're missing the core piece of the person. Well, let, may I share something with you? Since I'm a CEO of a company, I have leverage. I can hire and fire you. I can make or break you. I choose the former. And you judge somebody's character during chaos or during good times. And so what I have done, and maybe it's just the way that I was raised. First, I'm a guest in this country here. Mm. Makes it very humble, the fact that I've been accepted and grew a business. Mm. And so what I have to do is to ensure that these people, once again, have their pride and I wish I could give you a financial tip and trick or a cracked CEO code. That's the million dollar answer. But gentlemen, it's really just as simple as the relationship that I have with the people besides learning their language and giving them job stability and making it fun as well. I am setting that example that a CEO does know your name and does break bread with you. And as much as people are surprised, it seems normal to me. And these other people have the opportunity to do it and they don't. And I don't know what people, the stereotype of a fat cat business owner that should be bah humbug and firing people and kicking dirt in eyes. Well, those are the sort of kings that didn't last very long. And as I'm going to say before, I'm really only as stable as my foundation. Yes. I've had people with me over a decade. And these are the individuals through uh, delegation and through internal promotions have risen the ranks to floor manager and chief technical officer. And I couldn't be more proud. And these individuals not only speak for me, but they walk with me. And besides the money, if you can ever experience that sort of commitment, relationship and bond, that's priceless. I can't put I, I can't put a number on that. Right. And being humble and being grateful, these are certain things that will give you the endurance to last and maintain your reputation. Love that. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm like, so how do we sign up for training with you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> just watch this video today. <laughs> You'll do just fine. <laughs> but, but a lot of it, gentlemen, is just common sense. Just right. have manners. Right. Just be active listening and interested when you're speaking with people. That's all. Yeah, I, th- I think one of the things that you said, which is key, is the relationships, right? When we talk business, when we talk strategy, everything always for me always comes back to, does that build for longevity? Is that built for a decision that we're making today? Or is that built for a decision that's going to last tomorrow? And when we, when we look at those with our structure within ourselves, within the team, and one of the things, and one of the comments that Scott made to me was, he's like, I've never seen somebody who wrestles and struggles so much with how do you take care of your team so much, right? He's like, what about you worrying about you? And for me, it's always been community. It's always been a tribe. And so the more that I invest into them, the more that they're going to be willing to invest into themselves and their own growth and and make sure that the next person coming on board is also taken care of in the same manner. You know, so I really appreciate the things that you're talking about, the things that you're doing. And we share those values, don't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's incredible to know that other people are doing that because a lot of times, sometimes you feel like you're on an island because you, like you said, without the validation, you don't know what you're doing. And a lot of times you're hearing other people do it a different way. And for me, I'm like, I don't care, but sometimes you have to, right? Because you want to make sure that you're not setting yourself up for maybe, you know, heartache or heartbreak or, or even going down the path that, be, that hasn't been successful. But part of that is also why I strive to do things differently because I feel like that other people could benefit from that too. No, of course. You know, once again, if you can't settle on yourself, how can you expand to others? And so I think people gravitate towards you. You sound like a winner, but you also sound like a guy that might've gotten knocked around a little bit and has these (laughs) war scars so you can relate with people. Yes. And so I think that makes you a little bit more real, not telling you all the wins, but as they say, some of the losses. Yes. And those are the sort of stories that can get people through their tough times. Absolutely. Yeah. Man, you hit it right in the nail on the head. So, <laughs> you know, with that process of, you know, when you see people going into that next level, you know, a lot of times for me, what I found is I'm super excited. I love to see the growth, you know, that people have gone and you just never know who's going to show up or who, what, what somebody else is going to do. So what have been some of the, uh, maybe the high experiences or the wins that you've experienced from people who have gone through, you know, some of the stuff that you've you know, that you've taught them and what is that next level and what has been your contribution to maybe help them achieve success in the next steps? Well, I don't want wasted potential. I've seen people that have decided to take an inbound customer support campaign, just the coast. And the next thing you know, 10 years goes by. Mm -hmm. And so I want them to be converters. They have a lot of campaigns here that have very large commissions. In fact, if you're very talented on the phone, you might be able to earn more money than an attorney and a doctor in Costa Rica. Wow. And so it pays more than most vocations. And so when I see this potential, I just want to make sure, A, they're comfortable with it and that it makes sense for them. And maybe just do some of the advanced training with them. How about this? And and you'll, you'll respect that. Dedicated practice. I mean, you two make this podcast look easy, but nobody <laughs> sees what you do off the air and all the work that's put into this. And, and look at me now as a CEO. What about all the years and all the levels where I had to go from white to yellow to green to brown to black belt? And so, you know, let, let's, you know, call a spade a spade. And so it, it's very important for me that people understand the levels, because if they can't master this level, how do they expect to go to the next level? And do I want to make it easy for them? No, I want them to go the tough way. Mm -hmm. So when we start taking the plates off, then the bar feels lighter. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I overtrain them. So if it's that one in a million situation that happens to come up, you do have that spice in the rack. (laughs) You can bring that out. You've been trained for that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to break them. I'd like to bend them. And there's a lot of times, as Bruce Lee says, boards don't hit back. So we can practice as much as we want. 
but you're never seaworthy unless you get out of port. Mm. And so some of these individuals have to get some of these scars and some of this training. But instead of once again acting, I would prefer that they do more reacting. Mm. And so if they can practice their skills off camera, off the phone and out of work, not be obsessed with it. But if you have certain times when you can practice these speaking skills, which you can do anywhere, I don't need to plug in or download or have an internet connection to speak. And so if you can even record yourself, once again, we spoke about this earlier, that's even better. And so all the world's a stage. If you don't feel like speaking, then sit and observe people in public that are speaking. And instead of just zoning out, why don't you analyze that spike and dip and turn taking and things that you can do just to enhance those skills. And so you should always keep your mind going. And so instead of exhausting your mind, it becomes habit. You're just a second observer to it. It's incorporated in your life and your life becomes a little more lucid and you see things a little more clear. (laughs) That's huge. I think, oh man, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing about hearing how it's like, you've got to put the pressure there to allow them to have that growth momentum Um, because I brought this up to Patrick. We know coaches and it's very interesting how coaches were putting this out here about how when we're working with a client, we want to remove the obstacle from their journey. And I was like, we got to be mindful that this is their journey and they need that chance to overcome the obstacle because if you take it out of the way, what are you setting that person up for in the long run? Because if you're not allowing them to grow and shape themselves, you're hindering that potential for huge growth to take place because they haven't developed their tool set, their, their skill set, And so I think that's huge with, we're going to have that pressure there for you, but it's something that you need to go through to be able to be refined and really find that skill set that matches who you are as an individual. You have to let go of the bike eventually. And what sort of pressure? It's not my pressure. That's your pressure. Obviously, you know, balance and obviously you have the confidence to do it. You always had it in you. I don't know what took it so long to come out. Did it take me to, to grill you or to, or or to motivate you? But I believe once again, it's regards to maturity. As long as you can see yourself as being in the best light and being able to present yourself with your best foot forward, then put it out there. And you might be the sweetest peach in the world, but not everybody likes peaches. So, so good. (laughs) You know, what do you want me to do? But I respect somebody for getting hung up on that tries to name drop, you know, and do positive escalation in their rebuttals compared to someone that is stuttering, their timing is off, asking everyone how they're doing before they say we're good, thanks, and hanging up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not even in the moment. You're not focused. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that individual needs to put some water on their face. I know it's not their break time, but why don't you put the kid downstairs for a minute? Let him play a game of Pac-Man. Let him recharge his batteries, come up. Or why don't you just have him on non-ready status? Why doesn't Patrick sit next to Scott for a minute? Because Scott's on a roll and, and listen in on a call and high five him when he's closing another. And then maybe from that buddy system, then you get your groove back. And so I believe that if somebody pauses between calls and can get that sort of energy from someone sitting next to them, I'm not going to yell at you for not making that call that hour. Obviously, you're learning something from it. There's momentum there. There's high fives there. And don't kid yourself. You're still going to hit your numbers that day. But that's the sort of teamwork where you high five after a goal. Or if somebody gets a deal, you do the Hall of Fame call in the training room and you still, you know, you're still on that rhythm. And on that energy, it's still hot. And then the person that got the lead in real time, because it just happened, can stand up and go play by play. And then he'll probably miss one part of asking a name or a question. Everyone teases them. And it's just, that's how you grow. Because there's never a 100% call. There's always a 95. There's 5% wiggle. You don't know what happens. And maybe a natural stutter sounds better. Maybe a triple name drops someone just to get their point. I love things like that because it's still raw. And as long as you can keep that sort of momentum, it spreads on the floor. So if you got something really hot, get everyone to listen to it. It feeds up, get them right back again. And then don't be surprised if the numbers double. 
momentum is such a huge piece because for some people, they think that momentum is really hard to gain, but it's just a little bit of start is all you need. And sometimes surrounding yourself in the right position with the right people or, you know, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, right? We're always talking about trying to up our circle. I think that when you do have that transference of energy, right? Or somebody's sitting there and, and maybe they're just not focused. And then all of a sudden they see somebody else, right? There's a little bit of that friendly competition as well. That kind of makes all of a sudden that chip on their shoulder come up and somebody's ready to go. I love that stuff. That's the type of stuff that kind of gets me really excited when I see people who are energized about not only their performance, but also wanting to see other people do the same thing. How about, how about this philosophy? Me today, you tomorrow. There's no competition. Everybody equals out at the end as being aces. Mm-hmm. And the team wins overall anyway. So who cares who scores? Right. And what I love the fact is, is the selflessness. And when people are not egocentric and someone that is, let's say your competition, because they only make you lift more weights in the gym and, and work harder, but they're the first person to stand up and walk in front of everybody and to give you that five. And the tribe appreciates that. And they know that's a cool moment because if you think about it, Ali and Frazier, as much as they were boxing against one another, they loved each other and respected yes. each other. Uh, Foreman was in there too, excuse me. And so those three really had this sort of bond, even though they're beating each other up. <laughs> that was a brotherhood. You should the respect. I love watching the old videos. And if they didn't have one another, they would have never been such amazing mm-hmm. champions. Yes. <laughs> so the the interesting thing is you've had the journey coming from Philadelphia. I know you mm-hmm. talked, you had some time here in Colorado Springs that travel through the world and the interactions that you've had when it comes to, because you've talked about the idea of gamification and bringing it that level to interact with people. What really drove really tapping into gamification when you're working with individuals, when you're building your workforce, when you're just working with individuals, where did that passion with gamification come into play with how you incorporate your daily tasks with individuals? Well, you did mention the magic word, which is play. And I find that the best relationships are built through play. That's why recess was always my favorite class back in the day. (laughs) I just felt it was very important just to have a, that neutral environment. And also, I guess when potential clients come to visit me, it says three things. First is, why don't you have a game room in your office? (laughs) Second is, this is how I treat my people. And third is, this is how I treat myself. (laughs) <laughs> they say, but you're not professional. You shouldn't have games in an office. You should have another boring, uncomfortable piece of furniture or art in that area or some bad magazines that are seven years old that you don't want to read. And I said, no, no, listen, you do you. And this is my company. And I always believe maybe it's a youthful thing that I have, but I have one foot still that feels like I'm that 18 year old at Abington High School that wants to be a Spanish major. And the other foot is close to a 50-year-old man that's been in business and has responsibilities. And so if I can keep that sort of work-life balance and have that sort of fun set, and even once again, to share with the agents this amazing pastime and, and beautiful thing that I grew up with, that does separate my culture. You, you do need a special sauce. A call center industry is very rigid. There's just rows. Sometimes you don't have natural light and bad air. And there's a huge attrition rate and most people burn out or hate it. Mm. But the fact that I was able to excel in an industry with most people have a certain disposition on is, is amazing. It shouldn't have happened this way. I'm not gladiator that just didn't die mm. and for somehow became a prince. And so I'm very thankful for this and I'm very respectful of this industry. And so for me, once again, I just don't want to create an environment where people feel threatened or they're burnt out. And how about this? My job is that while you're here to recharge your batteries and self-esteem. So when you leave the office, you can confront any sort of challenges you have at home. Mm. Because once again, those things may affect your performance when you're at the work. 
And so I can't go home with you and I'm not going to pry and ask your information. But I also realize that my agents are human. And as I mentioned, they may be taking care of their families. And so that's very important for me. And if I can keep that sort of level head, I can look at them in their eyes and they can look at me in the eyes. And we both realize that we are supporting one another. That's crazy. It's not crazy because it's so uh, unreal. It's, it's crazy because I feel like it's a mirror of what I'm trying to project. Right. I feel like that these are your, all the things that like, these are not what traditional conversations amongst business owners are going through. And and so to be able to have this conversation with somebody who's actually doing that and, you know, has instilled the things that I'm trying to project, you know, out there and to know that it works, you know, so that's the verification that I needed, you know, for everything, you know, so thank you, Richard. I mean, this has really been kind of humbling, but um, but also at the same time, a, a really big eye opener for me to realize that, I don't have to maybe hold myself back in regards to how I want to take care of people, especially my, my staff. Doesn't it make you feel better to know that you're not alone? Absolutely. And that, and that the three of us gravitated towards one another because of the shared values. I don't know your family, but I could assume that this is how you were raised by your parents and grandparents. And so you're just doing it old school way, just like me. And that's very easy. It's like telling the truth. Right. I can tell the same story today as I can five years from now. And so as long as I keep this sort of very simple structure of ethics, morals, and just being a great guy, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised that this lucky streak that I'm on does not end anytime soon. Mm. <laughs> the phenomenal thing that came out of that whole thing was you were talking about creating a space to help somebody recharge, to go out into the world that you may not see. And that's a perspective that I've never heard of somebody actually highlighting or bringing to the forefront. So it goes into the aspect that you talked about. You've got 150 people that you're helping feed their family. You're helping giving a space that they can recharge have that safe space to be themselves because you don't know what's going on outside of the business. And so it's, it's one of those things that that perspective is for a legacy ninja that's listening, really taking that deep dive and understanding the power of what you can create and the ripple effect of what happens if you take a different perspective if you make that micro shift, like Dan Mangina has talked about, that micro shift, what does that do for you in the long run? Well, it's just about positive reinforcement. I mean, it goes both ways. Simple physics, action, action, reaction for me to them and them to me. And so I, I believe that things are done naturally and that the market speaks And if you can have certain relationships and people have been promoted and you become financially stable and you have this sort of legacy and influence when you're a guest somewhere, so you're not even on a home court advantage. These are the sort of things that I I think about and that make it very easy for me to discuss my success or thoughts with people because I, I, I don't have some sort of seminar that I'm selling. There's not a book here today, gentlemen, that I'll be promoting on your show. In fact, today was really much to put wind in your sails as much as you are to mine. And I, I couldn't thank you enough. And, and your audience doesn't realize this as well, that there was some communication, actually multiple communication prior to this podcast today. It was, it was scheduling and it was the fact of qualifying myself to make sure that I'm appropriate for your audience. And then we got on a call just to make sure I was real and that, and that I once again was a good fit. And so your audience has to realize that there's two professionals here that are just not investing their time for, for yucks and, and, and for ego. You two are on a bigger mission to, it's not even building your business. How did I, there's no money exchange today. So why are we even here? We're here because we're three professionals that are sharing ideas and energy and hopefully, as you were mentioning earlier, so that there are others that think 
similar to us. Mm -hmm. And so I really respect the work that you're doing. It's selfless. And once again, you're just giving. And if you don't think that this is going to come back in spades and that the stars are going to be aligned, you're, you're sadly mistaken. I'm going to be very excited to see how much higher you fly and further you go with this work that you're doing right now. (laughs) Thank you so much for that. You know, there's so many times that we've had these conversations and neither one of us has ever said, you know, when is the time coming? It's just a matter of if uh, or when rather, you know, and one of the things that has always been good, I think, about the symbiote relationship that we've had with the podcast is that we get so much out of our guests and we didn't we don't anticipate it. I mean, we get really excited. We go through this conversation. And as I was telling you before we started, you know, a lot of times I'm meeting you for the very first time two minutes before we hit the record button, just like today. Right. But I love that because it gives us the ability to have real, raw, authentic conversation. And it allows me to hear your story for the very first time. You know, Scott uh, highlights some things, but he he doesn't give the whole farm to me, which is really (laughs) nice because he knows he's like, just wait. Right. But also he's not he, he doesn't know so much either because he gets into the conversation. He's like, did that really just happen on our podcast? Did we really like man, there were so many nuggets that were dropped in that. And just so you know, it goes both ways. I mean, we're, we're so thankful for, you know, your willingness to come on your time and you reaching out because like Scott said at the very beginning, the validation isn't necessarily always there, but I think that we're confident enough in regards to the conversations that we're having, that we are going to find the right people to be able to continue to have that. And so far it, it has worked out probably better than I could have ever imagined. So, but yeah, thank you so much for, you know, for acknowledging all the things that go in there because a lot of people just think that they just come on, mm-hmm. hit the record button and go and put it out there. You know, there's so much thoughtfulness in regards to how we want to structure our conversations, the things that we want to hear and the things that we want our audience to hear. And you guys are succeeding and don't stop. And a lot of times people will say, hey, you should have heard my first or second podcast. I've, you know, I've come so far, but your greatest fans will love to hear that first podcast. Mm -hmm. And it's not mistakes. It's you just getting your groove and being excited and and being raw. And to me, the first draft is always the best draft. Mm -hmm. And if that was your first album that you put out, well, damn it. You guys are still touring on it and you're doing quite well. And, uh, and it's pretty cool. Thank you. So as things are moving for you, you're interacting with the individuals, you're taking that humanistic approach with the individuals that you interact with. And it's, I think it's a bigger vision of like a family feel family tribe piece, understanding the impact that you have with the space that you create so as you're going forward, what does this next five, 10 years look like for you, Richard? What is that that you want to bring forward? Or is there something, and maybe you don't want to share it because you never know, but we have this view that if you share it, somebody's going to hear it. You just never know. So when you look at the next five, 10 years, what is that vision for you on expanding what you've created, what you're building at this time? Wonderful. Well, since COVID hit, I saw more work from home agents. And so I've had to make that brick and mortar adjustment. People hired a call center because our internet redundancy, our backup generator electricity, and on-site IT support. Now, people working from home, they can still hit the metrics and do their numbers, but there is isolation there. And you could have 500 accountants working in a building. They don't talk to anybody (laughs) at a call center. It's a very, very social environment. There's a lot of synergy and a lot of shared energy. And so I believe a lot of people are not working to their top performance just because of that lack of relationship and communication. So this industry will continue to build. I was concerned before that I was looking for more space (laughs) because I was filling my 300 seats quickly. Mm -hmm. And now that people are work from home, I can have my core call center here 
for PCI compliance onboarding and just any sort of, if they're having trouble at home to be on a turnkey station. But for me personally, instead of having to build out a thousand seat center, I can just give them a turnkey computer, have them go home. Next thing you know, I got a thousand seats all over the country. <laughs> so it, it's, it's helped me. I, I, you know, on a personal note, I just miss walking the roads and I miss seeing everybody at one time. But on the flip side, I can have a Zoom call with somebody. And like yourself, I get to see all the cool stuff in the background. And you can when you call people's homes and you get to see the stuff bunny in the corner, or posters on the wall. And, you know, unless they're disclosing this at the call center, it's very rare that you get a glimpse into what makes them tick. And so we've opened up more communication channels. And so where do I see this going? I do see it more virtual. And I do see people learning or I guess reducing their social skills because of the lack of practice and contact. And so if people are capable of keeping these sort of skills and realizing how important it is to communicate with people face-to-face or to do follow-ups or to keep your word, custom, make an email, then you'll do very well. It's just when you get lazy, don't expect very good results. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like Rome that expanded their empire too much and it becomes thin. And so the further that the agent is away, the tougher it is for me, almost in a sense to bond with them Mm -hmm. and almost support them. I can do it, but you do know that, as I mentioned before, when you're, watching a movie it's a lot different from seeing a live play i mean you really really feel the energy and and get something from a call center and so i'm hoping that it's not pure ai where people are only talking to computers i I know that when you get frustrated you press zero you start cursing and you just want to speak to somebody and so unless they master that sort of ivr and response people are still going to want to talk to someone. Mm. And so maybe in the next five to 10 years, I still may have a niche market where people are looking for higher level concierge, personal first class service. Absolutely. And, you know, I almost feel like that it just enhances what you have that much more because the ones that are plugged in, the ones that are there, right. They're going to develop a skill set that is, like you said, at that point, now it's going to be maybe rare. It's going to be sought after so much more because they're immersed in it and because they're well-versed in it. And because we know they were not cutting corners. Now, listen, I got a home gym and I took advantage of that. So I I built it out (laughs) myself, but you know, perfectly well, a couple dumbbells at home is not the same as a world's gym membership. And so uh, you really want to be there with all the resources and the real resource are your coworkers. Mm -hmm. 100%. Having come up through the call centers, some of my best friends today are still the ones that I worked with in the call centers 17 years later. You went went to war together. (laughs) (laughs) Y'all got cursed out together. What do you you want to say? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) It's it's interesting to see how the relationships develop and the length of the relationships. And so, Richard, for yourself, what's been a highlight And what's been a challenge that you're thankful for that's taken place in your life? And what did that lead to by overcoming that challenge? Wonderful question. The highlight of my business is promotion from within, seeing people grow at my company. I'm so excited for that. The the seed turned into the oak tree. (laughs) Anyway, that's amazing. Um, The challenge for me, once again, I am bilingual. I study Spanish in college and I have the experience, but it's still not my native tongue. And so when there was a situation where something was escalated and people were emotional, I had to calm down for a minute, let them express themselves in their native tongue. Please back it up with English. So you doubled it up. So you're consistent. I in turn would give my point of view in English first, back it up with my Spanish. And hopefully with that 5% overlapping, we're consistent. Mm -hmm. And so there might be certain things. And we mentioned outside the office, I don't understand a cultural thing or even just a pure home court advantage language thing. And if I couldn't control it myself, I'd have my floor manager come in and speak for me. That was my challenge. And and it was very rare that that happened. But when I do realize that there is a code red and an escalation, 
you got to be very careful and delicate in regards to how people are expressing themselves. Challenges are one of those unique things that a lot of people will shy away from, and they don't understand the power of embracing the challenge and going and doing a deep dive and saying, okay, what did I learn from this? How did I grow? And what can I bring forward? And so it is one of those interesting things to get somebody's perspective on what has been that challenge that they're grateful for that has taken place. I have some good special potion for you that will protect you in those situations. If you walk into this with a mindset of good intentions and good faith, then regardless of the outcome, you represented yourself in the best light. I I can't guarantee that you're going to change your mind. But what I do know is my composure Hmm. and how I'm going to very much listen to you and see if there's a certain way that we can meet in the middle or at least to be able to diffuse the situation. And so I I do walk into, and even if they're throwing tomatoes at me and and they're upset because I'm a North American, I'm a business owner, I don't have hair anymore. (laughs) There's always going to be something that may upset somebody. And so, as I say before, if if I'm going into this situation non-threatening and trying to be at peace, I'm pretty much okay with the outcome and what happens. Richard, when you look back upon where you started when, when before all of this to where you're at now, did you ever in a million years think that you would be where you are today? And did you have any tell signs from the time that maybe you were little to realize that you're on the right path or trajectory, maybe something you didn't understand uh, from a young age and, until it finally hit? What a great question. What I didn't understand were the opinions that were provided for me in a predestined career. Mm -hmm. My great grandparents came over from Europe, from Romania, Russia, Germany, and Poland. And at the turn of the century, my uh, mother's side of the family were tailors and they created a business in New York City, Dream Togs. And my father's side came over and they were doing like the Sears Roebuck manual that they have, but they were doing uh, layaway for consolidated home furnishings as that's how they earn their money. So they were entrepreneurs. They came over and learned a second language. They started from scratch. And so for me, having to follow in my grandparents' footsteps of Harvard Law, my father at Columbia Business, and my brother at Washington and Lee University, mm-hmm. those are some pretty high bars to hit. Yes. Now, I didn't graduate private school. I went to public school. And my grades were good, but not good enough. And so without my college recommendation letter from my principal, I don't know if I would have gotten into Arizona. I mean, I'll be forthright with you. And so at that age of 18, instead of becoming a doctor, an engineer, you know, in law, what I decided was to double down on my favorite class, which was Spanish and communication. Because if all of my friends could not speak a second language, maybe I could be marketable. Maybe I could get a job and have leverage and not have my parents grill me. And so with my great grandparents being entrepreneurs and moving to another country, me learning a second language, not wanting to do homework for the rest of my life, and be <laughs> miserable, I almost convinced myself that if I ever had the opportunity, I would be ready. And this one in a million shot hit and I took it. And now if you can get past your parents' guilt, you can pretty much live anywhere in the world. And I didn't disappoint my parents. They just, and and usually it's like a naysayer or a gray believer. These are the people that love you the most. They might say N-O, but gentlemen, it's really that they don't K-N-O-W. Enough about what I'm doing. No, I I wasn't being a recluse. I wasn't breaking windows and, and, and just going crazy. You're looking at a young man that had momentum in regards to languages. And I was getting a lot of positive reinforcement from my teachers and peers I volunteered in college to work for Telemundo and they accepted me. And post-grad, I got a job from my Spanish. And so what are you going to do? I mean, I kept doubling and tripling down on myself. And, you know, it's almost like an 18 parlay. I just kept winning. Mm -hmm. And so why would I stop this sort of momentum? And now it gives my parents peace for the fact that I am feeding these families on financial stable. And I'm able to speak of myself, my organization, and my network in this sort of way, they realized that they raised a very good son. I love that. You know, the whole story of, you know, 
parents and grandparents coming over. So, you know, my grandfather uh, came over basically from Japan post Pearl Harbor and basically thought he was going to be a farmer, hated it, ended up getting his citizenship and, and joining the U.S. Army. First duty station was in Honolulu. Nice. Absolutely hated by everybody, right? Because oh, he's man. a Japanese guy in the U.S. military. So the military guys hated working with him. Japanese people hated him because he was working for the U.S. military at the time. Yeah. You know what? 22 years U.S. Army. All four of his children end up going, went on to serve. My dad did two stints to Vietnam. My aunt was a Vietnam vet uh, in the Navy. Uh, one uncle retired lieutenant colonel out of the Air Force. The other one was a mathematician engineer. And then my mom's side, same thing. She came over from South Korea. My uncle got his citizenship, did 26 years in Navy construction, still designs a lot of blueprints. And, you know, to have that. And, and my wife, being an entrepreneur, her parents came over with $100 from South Korea on a sponsorship and built, basically did whatever they had to do, um, worked multiple jobs, scrubbed toilets, you know, janitorial work. Uh, he was a carpenter. So he'd worked on these Ritz Carltons all over the world in India and Japan, but he was over here doing toilets just to, you know, provide and fast forward, you know, and my wife was supposed to go to Stanford university. And then she decided to go to CU Boulder or party school. And then she dropped out because she started doing nails and being a nail tech and, you know, all these different things. And of course, you know, the, the parents, they're, you know, they just, they don't understand because they just want so much better because they sacrificed so much and they did all these things. But now, right now they have their grandson and, you know, uh, my wife is a very successful business owner and, and, you know, so you just never know, but like your parents, you know, they now they're okay with it because now they understand, like you have to forward your own path. You have to find your own way. I appreciate you sharing your family's history. I'm surprised your last name's not hero. <laughs> what a family. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if your great grandparents didn't make the move and your grandparents and your parents and your wife and everything, it's being bold. Yes. You're taking risks. You want to talk about Darwinism? Fine. I mean, this is survival of the fittest. And you know, as a nomad, where you'll grow and we'll, you'll be the happiest. And mm -hmm. so I respect that too. And the fact that someone had to go against such sort of imagery and stereotypes during the Second World War, imagine that sort of resolve and backbone that was passed along in your family. And so as much as it might seem like a dark time in the United States, but for your family, it was a lesson to be learned that's been passed down from generations. Right. And so I totally respect that. Thank you. Yeah. I just, you, you're bringing out so much uh, out of this right now. And I appreciate that because a lot of times there's so much on the surface, right? And so many people are, are really reflecting on just the now you know, and for me, I feel like that when you find the people, when you can have that open dialogue, when you can really have true conversation and it doesn't matter because you know that the dialogue is going to be great because it's being reciprocal, because you're building that rapport. You can talk about things that have happened in the past. You can talk about, you know, projections of what you think maybe look like in the future. And you don't necessarily have to agree, but the fact that you know that you can have the conversation and that someone is willing to listen and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a rare thing nowadays. So to, you know, I never really correlated those things with of what I was doing in the call center when that happened, right? That I was creating that dialogue and being really the voice for the company. But had I been taught that maybe from early on to realize that, you know what, I am first line, um, you know, as and as a frontliner, I really make or break that impression of the business. Maybe I would have realized my importance was much higher than just being, oh, I'm just the, the low guy on the totem pole. Well, slow down for a second. Obviously, you took that position seriously and you mastered it. And that's why you are where you are today. You might have not realized it at the time. And sure, you might have swung a little bit harder for the fences. But obviously, you were a top producer at this call center. Mm. And if you were there for so many years, you learned the business and you learned what it was like as an employee to have those good and bad days. And I think that's why you're building an excellent team right now. Cause you, as I mentioned, have those war scars and those sort of real life experiences. 
So, <laughs> Richard is uh, dropping some nuggets here for yeah. you. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, left and right, I'm dropping them bombs. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I love and has been a really great piece for me to be transparent and be vulnerable in regards to sharing my story is yes. been the power of gratitude. And for somebody who's actually gone through, you know, multiple suicide attempts to come out to where I'm at now, you know, um, I refer to it often as what we call the beautiful struggle. And this part of being human, right, is to realize that you have the ability to learn when things don't go the way that you want. You have the ability to adapt, you know, and, and this human spirit that allows us to continue to press on even when things look very bleak. And so as you look back and reflect on your career, your life, you know, are, is, is there any specific pieces of gratitude that you would like to maybe highlight uh, maybe for the first time or just uh, in general, you know, for us, it's a piece that we really love in regards to our segment to be able to maybe even just give that thank you publicly to anybody that might've helped you along the way. Of course. And thank you for sharing that personal information about yourself. And it's something I've never personally experienced, but I try my best to understand where somebody could be at that stage in life. And I see it more as a forced march Mm -hmm. that people have to do. And I can almost relate it to the people that can cross the ocean, get out of the desert or, or leave the mountain when they're exhausted and have broken bones, but they still find something in them Mm -hmm. to continue on. And so I don't know you very well, obviously we're friends and we're going to learn a lot more about each other in these years, but there must've been something during those days that only you know about Mm -hmm. that got you to pick yourself back up to weigh the options and to realize that one thing was more important than another. And, and forced marches are fine as long as they don't last too long Mm. and when you're on this march what you can do is start picking up things along the way you can't maybe carry it you know with you the whole time but there might be some food you can have wind on your back Mm. resting under a tree Mm. and so these sort of things along the way on my path from the positive reinforcement of my language where people corrected my grammar so I wouldn't embarrass myself. Someone showed me what the culture was so I could participate. Someone explained to me the tradition so I could respect it. These are the sort of contributions that assisted me on my travel. So my car just kept putting along. But I had certain, and I can't really call them dark days. They were just days that it was like a Sisyphus where you're pushing the rock up the hill and it kept coming back down. And you know, 80% of people usually quit. And so those are some of the dark moments when you ask yourself, do I give up? But then you go back and you ask me the question about my childhood. I made that commitment to myself prior to even high school that I was going to live a life of adventure. I wasn't going to be someone that gets shoved into a, you know, train car or be one of the one of the thousands walking down a a sidewalk in a big city with a briefcase. I just I just didn't want to go into that Pink Floyd, you know, meat grinding machine like all the students did. And I didn't want to be faceless and nameless and just a number. You get a hundred years here. I, I don't want to make a fool of myself or be notorious. But I also realized that there was some sort of destiny I had of personal fulfillment and one of the mediums that I was able to achieve this was through languages and that sort of Wu Wei philosophy of least resistance this language opened up so many doors where it almost carried me into this position into Costa Rica into the marriage to my Costa Rican wife and so there's no way I could have written this when I was in Philadelphia and if someone said to me, hey, you'd be an owner of a call center and you make this money, but you have pinball machines. Whoa, 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 pinball machines. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing I'd be asking about. I got all that other stuff. I don't need, remember like the movie Big? Yes. He started making money. He was jumping yeah. on the trampoline and had, and had all that fun. So yeah, that, that's me. It's not, it. it's not those bells and whistles. It's the goodies that come with it. But I guess it makes it sweeter. 
And, you know, when you make it to the top of the hill, it's more of the journey. And I'd love to tell you there's shortcuts, but there's not. And there are days when you take five steps back or you have a flat tire or some, or there are some times in Costa Rica, the rain comes down and I'm going to suit outside instead of running somewhere, I go, ah, screw it. I just put my arms out. I take it, ruin my suit. Let's just do it. You know, it's, it's almost like uh, what was it? Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump yeah, you know, when he was on the ship. Yes. And so there's certain times when, yeah, let it rain on me. Because if that's the worst thing that happens to me today that I ruin a suit and I get rained on, I'm having a great day. <laughs> so that's an excellent way for me to dance in the rain. And so my agents look outside and think, what the hell's wrong with Hefe? <laughs> Don't worry about Hefe. I'm, there's a method to my madness. Just, just be patient. <laughs> right. Just be patient. Oh, man, that's awesome. No, I think that it's, it's interesting because when you had recorded your solo episode, and that was last year, wasn't it? That was September or something like that. But you actually talked about the the journey and having the flat tires and a couple steps backwards sometimes. And it's just interesting how when we have conversations with individuals, with guests on the show, how things that we've discussed or highlighted and how that comes to the surface by somebody else sharing that perspective. It's one of those things that's like we're not just speaking just to be long winded there's things out there that have happened. And so if we can share a perspective that's different from ours, but somebody's given something similar, but their own perspective, it's a huge thing because that could be that one perspective that somebody needs. And it's not coming from us, but it's coming from the relationship and the connection that we've had with somebody else with allowing them to share their perspective and just the power of what that does for somebody else down the line. When that is, we don't know, um, but it is a phenomenal thing just to see the interconnection piece from things that we've talked about and we've highlighted. So I appreciate that, Richard, and just for yourself, and it goes back to just the vulnerability and the transparency piece, because I, we talked about this during our pre-call was you don't get this from a lot of people that are CEO at these bigger positions because they're trying to have this facade and they're trying to keep this perspective to keep everybody else in line and it doesn't work and so that perspective of what you shared is huge and i appreciate that just being open and transparent well you would have been my friend if i was plastic i know i'm wearing a suit right now but i'm (laughs) I'm still just a man and i did this out of respect for you and your audience and for myself but i don't know who they're trying to kid or what game they're trying to play or what actor they want to be on television Mm -hmm. the real life are the people that work with you and have to go home at night not you to your mansion where you can eat your caviar and get fanned by your (laughs) swarm of servants no and so you also have to realize you were in those shoes one day as well you might be in a comfortable position today but who knows tomorrow and not saying that you should be paranoid or carpe diem but i don't understand today where these CEOs have this sort of image that they need to portray. And so I could be down here driving a $100,000 car, and I could. But I also realize I'm in a third world country. I don't want to rub that in people's faces. And also, it might make me a target. And so what are we trying to do? And I'd rather you judge me on merit. And I even mentioned earlier, that what's so important in the States for this image that you're talking about and the flash and the cash and the, and all this stuff, a lot of that doesn't mean anything here. Mm-hmm. So as much as I'm going to try to impress somebody with something, it doesn't mean anything. And so I had to readjust my values on how I was raised mm-hmm. and the influences and images that I was supposed to live up to. And I almost, it's almost liberating where by default, I say, yeah, you win, you win. I'm, I'm just going to go abroad and, and not worry about this. I'm still the same person from Philadelphia. I still, I still have that upbringing and I'm still got that go-getter mentality, but I'm not going to stress over the things that I saw my parents and what my friends are stressing on mm-hmm. in the United States. Now you could move abroad, but you still might be taking that baggage with you I decided to live a different type of life. And it's been very good for me for my health, my mental health, physically as well, and physiologically. I feel great. And 
people can see that. And if people see that I'm having good days and I'm relentlessly positive, it's authentic. It's not just five minutes here and the rest of the day I'm pissed. Then, 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 then that's not consistent. In fact, when I am tired or not feeling well, then people say, you're right. <laughs> you know, you don't seem normal today. Well, come on. <laughs> what do you expect from me? As I say before, just look at yourself from there and, and just be real to yourself because that's how you will keep your friends. And that's how we keep your business relationships like you two have. And I think you'll have a much more fulfilled life by doing things like that. Love it. So I have a couple of questions here. A couple of times we've talked about pinball. Uh, yeah. Did you know that uh, on TV, they actually have like pinball championships where people are going head to head playing against each other? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could take them on with NBA fast break. That's my best game. But it, um, okay. You know, I got a game that's from 1976. It's a Bally's Freedom. And the newest machine I have is like a last action hero. And most of my stuff are really pretty much from the late 80s to early 90s, which I believe were the best times for pinball because of the equipment that they have on the inside. Mm. When I get these machines, don't kid yourself. They don't have glass at them. They got bird crap on the play field. And it almost breaks my heart. I go, honey, <laughs> what happened? And so I'll bring them to my call center. I'll be in a suit, but I don't care. I'm putting Wildcat 125 and shining up the play field. And there's places in the United States where you can order the LED screens and the rubbers and the bumpers. And so I have some expert electricians here. And when I order the specific parts, they just go through it and fix it up. And for something I bought for a couple hundred bucks, next thing you know, I got a restored $5,000 machine that's behind yeah. me. And so, you know, as long as these people don't want these machines and it's taking up space and they realize with my passion. And I can't hold it. When I show up there, I'm supposed to be calm and cool and try to negotiate an extra 25 bucks. Hell, it's like the movie 10 with Dudley Moore and Bo Derek. I'm running towards it. You know, <laughs> my arms open. I can't wait to buy this machine. I'm almost overpaying the guy to guarantee that I get the deal. <laughs> and um, my passion became an obsession. I got 13 machines right now. And, and fortunately, I have the room for it. If not, I have an air hockey table, an Alpine racer too. I got a bunch of machines and jukeboxes. And so, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And if they think that stuff is trash, I have, call me Oscar the Grouch. I'll take it all. <laughs> all right. And so it's so much fun to find treasures. And mm. most of the time they're in half decent condition. And then, you know, it's just the restoration. That's all. Yeah. I, uh, I, I saw it the other day and, you know, I think for me, I remember that was one of the few things that my father actually enjoyed when it came to technology. Now he's like into podcasts and things like that, which to me is so weird because he'll listen to every single podcast except mine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to tell him to fix your tie constantly. Right. right. But no, I, you know, some of my fondest memories it's just sitting there and being amazed at how good he was at a pinball machine. I mean, he, you know, he was, he was a decent pool player, but you know, my brother and I grew up in that time frame in the arcades and, you know, um, I watched my brother where he could play all day off of 50 cents and have people line up. And he, you know, I remember one time he went on a 300 win streak in, in street fighter. <laughs> right. But that inspired me. So I actually did, um, basically traveled around and did uh i guess you would call it professional gaming now long before what they have now where kids can win like a million dollars from these tournaments from home we used to have to like travel and drive and you know we'd drive 400 miles to nebraska 500 miles down to texas and california and have all these things and have like 10 guys packed into one hotel room <laughs> we all smelled awful you know, <laughs> things like that but to go from that, but, you know, but there is something cool about like the vintage piece and, and the lights and, and, you know, how it really stimulates the brain, but you, but you, there's still a manual control to it and a skill set that you control it for the most part and extent, right? I mean, there's certain times where it just goes right down the middle, can't do anything <laughs> about it, but, you know, um, and I equivalent that thought process, I equivalent, you know, those lights and sounds a lot of times for what's happening in the news or things that are trending, but I still have control over what I can control. Right. And sometimes that ball goes right down the middle. 
I can't do anything about it, but I roll with punches and I just roll that next ball. So um, I just really thought it was really cool to, um, to see that you have your passion and that you can integrate that with your business. Well, it's almost like someone playing racquetball. They're just hitting the ball and there's others that have strategy. Yes. If you're playing pinball, the number one rule is to be able to trap that ball yes. and then aim for certain targets. It will prolong the game. It will give you better scores. And there's actual, if you watch where the lights are and there's certain progressions of a game play, there is a certain sort of strategy to playing these machines. And, and yes, each one is just so unique in regards to the cabinet, to the play field, to the artwork, and to the distribution of the bumpers and the targets. But to me, I find the marquee, the marquee art, so fascinating. And I don't know. I mean, you have this company, if I'm not mistaken, what is it called? Twin Galaxies, where they keep all the Hall of Fame Mm, uh, scores. And people used to travel there in the Midwest and compete. And and what was it? Uh, Billy Mitchell was always number one or something. And I always found that was interesting. But there is a place in Arizona that I go to in Mesa. I, I, sorry, the name slips my mind, but they got over 40 pinball machines, over 200 machines from asteroids to trine to whatever you name it. And I would go there for a full three hours. And as much as I want to, I'll do a one game of Tron and Asteroids. Yeah, I got you. I love it. But I will flip those pinball machines and I'll go one after another. And sometimes when you see a machine in a movie and then you get to see it in real life, it's Mm. almost like seeing a celebrity (laughs) and, um, and you have respect for the machine. Don't tilt it. Don't bang it. I mean, these are things that break a machine. Mm -hmm. And if you say the ball goes down in the middle, then play your game differently. And also you have to gauge the sort of inclination of the play field to see how your game play is going to be. And so Elton John said it perfectly. I mean, you become one with a machine besides your timing, which is your muscle memory. I mean, you really feel the flippers and the buttons and this machine. And people say, well, you know, I, I played virtual pinball. Yeah, but (laughs) there's a lot of things you do on the internet that's not as good as real life. And (laughs) one of them is gaming. And so I think pinball is an experience and and they're beautiful pieces of art. And each one is so unique in its own way. And once again, there are certain products out there like this Wildcat 125, which is specific for pinball and air hockey play fields. Mm -hmm. And you should not put chemicals on it. Do not draw on it. I mean, these are things that can be preserved. And sometimes the cracks or the fading, that sometimes adds to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not like you got the machine brand new. And if you got it in a certain condition, mm-hmm. then it should be preserved. Mm-hmm. But as much as I can keep original on these machines, I love it. And so you, you see my passion. You see yeah. how I feel about these machines. And trust me, I'm not going to stop. And, and with my wife, that is one hill I'm going to die on. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll let her win on everything. But when it comes to these machines, honey, you know I'm going to be upset if I don't buy it. Right. So um, I, I think we've made that sort of uh, truce and, and we have that sort of plan. So uh, any legacy ninjas that are out there, if you know of uh, you know some pinball machines that uh, could use some TLC or maybe they're taking up space, uh, reach out to Richard. <laughs> oh, I'll ship it down here. No problem. <laughs> I'll take it off of your hands. So. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. So, uh, Richard, as we wrap up here, is there anything, any last remarks, anything that came up last minute, thought-wise, that you wanted to share or leave the uh, Legacy Ninjas just to kind of chew on and think about? No, of course. Well, first is I, I want to thank you again for this time. It, it was an excellent show and we shared so much and you guys are just so much fun. So this is amazing. <laughs> um, but to your amazing audience, I, I want people to stand up and have their chin up and shoulders out and, you know, shoulders up and chest out. And But do me a favor. You, you have to be true to yourself. Because at the end of the day, when your head is on your pillow or you're looking in the mirror, you have to at least look at yourself in the mirror. Because if you have a problem doing that, then we got things to really talk about. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't tell you to be rash and just leave your job and and follow a dream. I think you might want to try a a side gig or dip your toe in the water and test it out a little bit. Or, Or maybe get outside of your bubble and speak to a stranger 
because you're not going to be prejudged. And this individual might give you some actual balls and strikes and tell you something. Because if you, if you keep speaking to the same individuals, naturally, you're going to get the same responses. And so I'm not telling you to go bother strangers down the street. But if you have having a beer, speak to a bartender. If you happen to be sitting next to somebody somewhere just for a minute, you might have that sort of connection. And some of the best advice I've received in life have been from perfect strangers that I've never met before that might have seen me pondering something or I'm pacing or, or just out of not desperation, but needing able to vent or just to speak, I, I, I will strike up a conversation with somebody. And it's usually someone that's older and wiser. And I, I used to do this a lot in college. When I'd be at the gym, for an example, there'd be someone working out next to me. I'd find out about themselves. And I'd say, hey, let me ask you a question. Post-grad, what do you think about this? Or what happens if a girl breaks your heart? <laughs> you know, just to see what they got to say. Yeah. And um, today, it's almost the reverse. Or I'm the wise one. Mm. And people are coming to me for questions. And, and so what I try to do is to give not just the best advice, because I don't know if it's the best for them, but I can give them advice that has made me successful and discuss certain choices I've made that got me here and other choices that like in the book, choose your own adventure where you fall down the trap door and story ends. <laughs> and so I, I have to give both sides of the story so they know what's hot and what's cold mm. and what's safe and what's dangerous. And so my suggestion for your audience is once again to expand their network and just start asking questions and opinions of people that might give you, as you were mentioning before earlier, which was great, a different perspective on, on your position. That, that alone could just be the whole episode <laughs> uh, because I think the fact of people taking the time and not being fearful of the perspective of others, the opinions of others, but we have everybody that there's a lot of people that want the yes bin. They want people that will resonate. They want the echo chamber, mm -hmm. which doesn't do anybody any justice. And so that piece right there alone, we could have just had the whole episode right there because mm -hmm. that is a needed nugget for people to really tap into and hold on to. Yeah, if someone starts yes manning me, I call him Smithers. Yes, yeah, Smithers, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Burns' assistant, stop yesing me. I mean, give me a real answer like Homer would. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, man. Gosh, Richard, there's so many different things to extract from this. Just thank you again for your willingness to come on. And, you know, what is so incredible is that you wanted to come on just because you like the dialogue. And that's incredible to me because you, you guys were the cool table in the lunchroom. I just want to hang out <laughs> with you. <laughs> May I be invited to a party or two? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, um, so I definitely feel like that this is just the first of many conversations we would love to. I mean, there's because of there being so many nuggets because of, you know, you showing us a, a small glimpse of who you are today. I mean. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to continue this conversation, even again on another episode of a podcast at some point, more or less. I mean, just gosh, I'm so thankful and I'm not even, like flabbergasted, honestly, with how many nuggets that you were able to drop in such a short amount of time. So thank you so much for that. Well, my brother, you brought this out of me. <laughs> <laughs> this is not my show. This is your show. <laughs> and And so obviously you're very good at what you do. So you got the best. <laughs> appreciate that and then as we go here uh to end the show if somebody wanted to connect with you ask questions get some insight potentially whatever they were looking at what is the best way for them to connect and have that communication with you the well, first is they grab a plane ticket and fly down here <laughs> but if they're not able to do that today they can give me a call toll free at 888-271-6750 you can shoot me an email at CEO at Costa Rica's call center.com. And, and finally, and this is where you gentlemen will be, I have a very large Facebook fan page, about 97,000 local Costa Rican Ticos are on that. And it'll give you a pulse of the local BPO business processes outsourcing industry and, and also some of the great and cool things that we do in the evening. Awesome. So other than that, Legacy Ninjas, 
there's things here that you can extract. It's just doing the work and finding what that is for you that you need to take with you to move forward. Other than that, do the deep dive, find out what that is for you, make that micro shift that's going to allow you to move forward. And of course, thank you for allowing us to be part of your journey to be able to bring these perspectives and share them with you and just walk along with you on your journey to that legacy that you're extracting, that you're building. Other than that, we'll catch you later.